Hello, hello. It's my special day, all right. Everyone cheer. So, good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Pint of Science 2022. This is the third and final and best event of the series in King's College London so far. So, you're in for a treat. Quick show of hands. Who's here because they like science? Who's here because they like marine conservation? And who's here because I made you buy a ticket relentlessly? There's my entourage in the background. Welcome, welcome. So my name's Andrew and I'm a PhD candidate here at King's College London in the Geoffrey Department. I'm not a marine scientist. I'm a queer theorist. So not very qualified to be here. <laughs> Just here for the crack. But I do do marine science because apparently there's a species of whale that is the grey whale? The grey whale. whale is actually a gay whale. <laughs> so science for everyone. In my personal research, I get into science through the fact that there's a river in London with fish, oysters. They could be gay. Who knows? Don't assume their gender. But where's my clicker? As I fumble through this. So tonight we're looking at marine conservation in Man Overboard, Survival of the Fishest. Was that you, Constance? Did you come at that nine? Brandon. Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. So... Pint of Science, a quick history. Who's been to a Pint of Science event before? Great. Who will come next year? Who will come without me telling you to come? Great. So Pint of Science actually is a UK-wide and global event taking place right now at more than 25 countries in the world. So, you know, bringing science to the people. If you're going to be tweeting us, please tweet us, hashtag, is it Pint22? Pint22, or at PintsWorld. But we have three amazing speakers tonight, whose names I learned 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't prepare. We've got Dr. Michael Williamson, who's a research associate at the Institute of Zoology, whose talk will be on Google Sharks spying on sharks from space. <laughs> bow, 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 bow. Um, we've got Hannah Wood, a PhD candidate at King's College London, Woo! whose talk will be on f Fitbirds, <laughs> tracking seabirds to monitor their activity. And our third and final speaker is Constance Shrey, PhD candidate at King's College London again, Woo! who's talking about, is this the real science or is this just fantasy? <laughs> Who knows? I'll be the judge. But, any questions before we get started? Yes. Where's the fire exit? Where's the fire exit? In the event of a fire, scream, panic, there are windows available to jump out onto, but follow the signs down the stairs, round the corner. I'll be first because I'm too pretty to die. <laughs> but, here, Freddie Mercury, everyone. Here is our agenda for tonight. So we'll have a welcome by me, Tick. We will have two talks by Mike and Hannah. Then a quick break, there'll be a quiz. There'll be a prize. What is the prize? You. Me? <laughs> I'm not that cheap. The prize is a pint of science 2022 glass. Exclusive. 10th edition. 10th edition. Like a good, we have two. We have two glasses available on eBay with Kyle at half past nine tonight. <laughs> then we'll have our last talk, general Q&A. Thank you and prize gifting. So, any further questions before we get started? Great. Where are the toilets? Down the stairs. Down the stairs again, bash your head on the ceiling. I've done it four times. Have a concussion, pee and come back. Yeah? Right, so over to Michael. Woo! Hi everyone, thanks Andrew for that uh, illuminating intro. Um, not oh, there we go. 
Um, yep, so my name's Mike Williamson. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Zoology, but I did my PhD at King's, and that's what I'm going to talk to you today about. And we're going to kind of look at um, how we use satellite technology and tagging technologies to kind of uh, follow shark movement around the planet and around different ocean systems. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, reef sharks and their conservation. How are satellites used to help us in for shark conservation? And how do we monitor coral reef habitats, which are really important habitats for sharks, um, um, using satellites? And how does changing coral habitat due to climate change impact uh, reef shark movement? Um, so just a bit of a background. So my research interest is mainly in the movement ecology of marine species. So basically, I like to tag things, go out and sit on a boat, sit in the sun, enjoy myself, pretend I'm doing work. And, um, and kind of follow the movements of marine species. So as many of you guys know, and it's probably why we're here, marine species aren't doing so well. So I've been lucky enough to work on turtles and big whales like humpback whales, North Atlantic right whales, and reef sharks. And following their movement is really important for their conservation because if we know their kind of migration patterns and where their foraging areas are and how they move around, we can help conserve those areas. So by tagging them and... Um, and following that movement, we can really help their conservation, or that's why at least I tell everybody when I'm sitting on a boat, selling myself. Um, so today I'm going to mainly focus on reef sharks. So what is a reef shark? It's basically any shark that sits on a reef. Um, we have, so you have, they're kind of broken up into a couple. So the species on the right, we have um, reefs associated mesio predators, which is a, just a fancy term of sharks that just stay around the reef for the m most of their life. So they're helpfully named gray reef shark, black tip, reef shark, things like that. So they, it's very um, easy naming. So they spend a lot of time, they forage, they breed there, and yeah. Um, and then the second kind of lot are those bigger kind of um, more sexy predators like the tiger head, the hammerhead. So they may not spend lots of times there, but they'll visit seasonally. Um, they might go there to predate at certain times a year or to breed there. So basically lots of different sharks use coral reefs as important habitats. And what really links all these sharks um, together is that their populations are declining. And they're really not doing very well. Over the past um, 50 years, the populations have plummeted. And this is primarily through industrial fishing. So this could be due to bycatch in, in nets from non-target fishing, so from, say, a tuna fishery or a mullet or something like that, but also for the shark fin industry, which I'm sure you've heard about. So shark fin soup in Southeast Asia can be a, um, a bit of a delicacy, and um, that's driving a lot of the shark fin trade and the declines of populations in sharks. However, reef sharks are also affected by climate change, um, particularly because coral reefs, like the sharks, aren't doing so well. So if you've ever been snorkeling around, you may have seen these bright, colourful reefs, but you've probably also seen patches of really white reef. And that's due to climate change and global warming, predominantly. Basically, <laughs> you have your, uh, your coral reef, and they are kind of a symbiote, basically. And what that means is that they live with a little algae, which from that they get their nice bright colours, but that's also how they get their food. However, if it gets too hot, or it's too polluted, or it's too cold, that algae decide, uh, they expel that algae, the coral comes night, um, goes bright uh, white and they can't feed and eventually they die. So dead habitat is not particularly good for, coral reef, um, for reef sharks. The fish don't go there and um, they don't tend to do so well. So how do we monitor sharks? Um, there's two main technologies. There's satellite uh, tagging, which Hannah might talk a little bit about more with birds. And what that does is they're kind of biggish tags and we put them on, on the top photo. We put them on the fins of the sharks and that can, take real, that can um, collect really fine scale data on things like depth and fine scale movement. Um, and when that shark comes to the surface or when you, or the tag falls off the shark, that will release all that information up there. Um, um, to a satellite, which we can then download and, and analyze. Um, however, because sharks tend to spend the majority of the time under the water, um, the batteries don't last very long. So you can only really get data for about a year um, or so at best. So the best um, other technology we use is acoustic telemetry, which is kind of what I'm going to talk about, and the data we use for tracking technologies for my PhD, and I'm going to talk to you about tonight. So what is uh, acoustic telemetry? Well, basically we have a really scary shark here. And we give it a little tag, so it's a bit like an oyster card. And what this does is it releases an acoustic symbol, signal, which is detected by a receiver, which we have dotted around a reef system, so like a coral reef or an estuary, any area of interest. 
And what happens is we have our, um, we have our receivers here and our scary shark comes along and it, gets, it, um, it goes near a receiver where it's detected, comes down again, and you can kind of figure out the movement pattern, how it's around. So it's kind of core scale. It's not as fine scale as, acoustic, as satellite telemetry, but you can figure out where it goes. And you can get these nice movement patterns. And the advantage of this technology is that these are really small. And because they only use an acoustic signal, they don't use up a lot of battery. So you can put them on a shark, and they can last up to 10 years. So you can look at really long scale processes. So you can look at how shark movement is changing over long periods of time. So satellite data, um, I'm going to talk to you now about why and how we use satellite data to aid shark conservation and look, in, and look at shark movement. Um, most people with sh um, satellite telemetry, uh, um, satellite technology, sorry, um, they think of imagery. But actually, the majority of the stuff is we use that to detect the different variables off the ocean surface. So rather than using imagery, we use um, um, we basically use uh, it to collect things like wind, sea surface height, current, and sea surface temperature. And from that, we can use that to look at loads of really cool different um, sciencey things around um, shark um, movement ecology. So that could be foraging ecology, so where they're feeding and why, um, the habitat use. Um, we can use it even to aid industri industrial fishing because if there's certain variables that are linked to the sharks, and if they're present, we can tell the uh, fisheries to stop at that time of year to stop bycatch. Um, which can aid the conservation and management. But importantly, we can also use satellite um, technologies nowadays to look at changing coral reef system, because as mentioned, they're not doing so well. So it's now becoming a really important method of looking at coral reefs, because it's a lot easier to use satellite data, which is freely available, and you can go on your computer, rather than having to go out to a coral reef um, regularly, which is very expensive, if not quite as fun uh, sitting at your desk, which is tend to what I do. Um, so just there's some kind of satellite data basics. How do they detect um, this information? So if they're not using imagery, how are they doing it? Well, satellites basic um, are working as a, they detect something that's reflected from the surface. So this could be passive. So this could be from the sun or an infrared ray that bounces off the Earth, Earth surface and the satellite detects that reflection. And that could be used to detect something like sea surface temperature. Or you use and an active satellite, which actually is a, works a bit like an echo. So it will send a radar signal or a LIDAR, which is light, basically, and, and that reflects back, and then it detects that reflection like an echo. And from those differences, you can work out things like ocean current um, and how high the and sea surface height. And why is this kind of important? Why do we use satellite data? Well, it's at a global scale. There are lots and lots of satellites um, flying around the world now. So we, the whole of the world's oceans are mapped now, which makes it a lot easier than us than going out there, putting out little sensors and coming back, um, which is great. <laughs> um, also, it's just constantly available. These satellites are whizzing around, and there's lots of them. So we can get daily data from all these different variables, which is really handy and really easily, which wasn't available, and also wouldn't be available if you had to put sensors out in the ocean and go out and collect them. And also, it's getting cheaper. Initially, it was really expensive, but now there's free data available that any of us could access, and which is great for poor scientists, which don't have a lot of funding. And um, yeah, so it's really attractive to be used by scientists and NGOs who don't really have a lot of money. So my aims of the PhD were to kind of look at how do we monitor important reef shark habitat um, using satellite data. And also, can we combine different tagging technologies, so that acoustic data, with satellite data to find how the changing shark habitat from climate change impacts their movement? So I use Google Earth Engine, which is a free and open access resort that you guys can all access. And it's a, just an amazing place where you, it, just has, it's just a warehouse on, online for lots of environmental information. And from that, you can get really cool stuff like the fishing hours um, that I've c calculated around the world, or sea surface temperature, or sea surface height. And it's all there for you to access. And using this data, we built, as most millennials seem to want to, an app. Hooray. And, <coughs> and uh, so what we did with this was is we were able to, you get your nice little coral reef that you're interested in. And we wanted to know, OK, what is the sea surface temperature at that point in that time? And we can obtain that data using this app now. But also, not only that, we, we assign a stress score to it. So if the, the temperature is really hot, the coral reefs are going to be really stressed, right? 
if it's a bit cooler, they're not going to be as stressed. So we assign a stress score to each variable, and we use nine different variables that we've known that impact coral reefs. And from that, we're able to calculate an index just to see how stressed the reefs are. So this is just an example of that. This is just SST. So the color scheme, I don't know whether you can see it at the bottom there. So yellows are like one where it's going through quite a lot of stress, and the blue scores uh, where it's less stressed. So this is just for temperature, for example. And you can see the little plot on the left-hand side is how the stress is changing um, on our reef system in that black dot over time. So from that, we can just see over time how the stress on the reefs are changing. And we can do that for nine different variables. Um, so this is just kind of a, a plot, a bar plot of those nine different different variables. And we've, so I kind of collated it for three different reef regions, so the Central Indian Ocean, Great Barrier Reef, and the Western Indian Ocean. And you can just see how the, um, these variables change over time. So the orange bars are during El Nino years, so I don't know if too many people have heard what an El Nino is, but basically it means the water temperature really, really hot. And when that happens, the reefs tend to die. So it's not great. So I was able to compare between an El Nino year and a, a non-El Nino years to see if there was any differences. And you can see kind of the, there's certain variables which change during that time. For example, the DHW means de degree heating weeks. And that's just simply how, um, how strong the, uh, the sea surface temperature is over the, over the annual mean. So if it's a degree over the annual mean, that's not great. And that's what that's showing. So that's what's in this thing to take home is just that's what's driving kind of some of these high temperatures, the degree heating weeks and sea surface temperatures tends to be a bit higher, but it varies from place to place. And also we can combine this into an index to look more locally. So this is the Chagos Archipelago, which I'll be talking about later, which is one of my um, research sites. And this is a big MPA in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And it's got loads of pristine coral reefs. Well, they were. Um, until um, lots of coral beaching happened because of El Nino events. So this is just shows the stress store between, on the left-hand side, is a non-El Nino event. <clears throat> so it was April 2012, nice standard temperatures, compared to uh, April 2016 during an El Nino event. So you can see there's a lot more stress on the reefs on that system at that time. So we then wanted to combine that with our shark data um, to figure out how are these changing reefs impacting the sharks. Um, and to do that, we looked at kind of three metrics of shark movement. So um, we looked at movement diversity. So this was how the sharks, which, um, how many different areas the sharks were moving around that reef system. We looked at movement frequency, which is how many movements they're undertaking. And also residency, it's just how, how much time they're spending on the reefs. And our study site, as mentioned, was the uh, Chagos Archipelago. So this is a kind of a pristine MPA, um, marine protected area, which Constance will talk about later, I think. And um, in there, we wanted to use that site because it's not influenced by other things like pollution that can, or, or, f or fishing, in theory, um, because it's a, a marine protected area and they shouldn't be fishing there, that may impact the shark movement. So we're able to use this system to purely look at how changing the changing weather and the changing ocean conditions were impacting shark movement. And we used two species, which are the black, um, so the gray reef shark, which is at the top, and the silver tip shark at the bottom. And we, um, uh, we tagged about 170 of these um, sharks with these little acoustic transmitters. So I think you can see on the bottom, uh, on the bottom picture. So they're about, I, don't, I couldn't grab one with me, but they're about that big. And um, we put them into the body cavity of a shark. So we, we fished for them using barbless hooks, which is completely, <laughs> completely fine. Everyone looks at me and goes, you, you cut open the shark. Are they OK? And I always say, well, shark sex is pretty brutal. What we do to them is what that they're completely and utterly used to it. And also, we've been, t we've been detecting them for 10 years after this, so they're fine. They're swimming around. They haven't like killed off. It's not as if we stopped detecting them. So it might seem a bit harsh, but uh, we all have ethics and permits we've got to go through as well. But um, yeah, so we've got data, movement data from about 170 different sharks around this, arch this um, coral reef archipelago to analyze. So what did we find? Well, this is silver tip sharks. And what we found was that during really low stress conditions, um, the sh so the green circles here are simply the how many different areas that receiver, that site is connected to. So basically, the bigger the circle, the more areas it's connected to. And the gray lines are the number of movements that are taken between it. So what you can see is in low areas, they're moving to lots of different areas, and they're conducting lots of movements. 
when it gets really stressed, they're reducing their movements and they're, re um, and they're reducing the number of areas they visit, which is quite an interesting finding. So basically, when it gets hot and horrible, they stop moving, which is probably a lot, a lot, a lot of people on the beach in Marbella as well. Um, and this is the same thing with the grey reef sharks. Um, but what you might notice here is that those circles are a lot smaller compared to the silver tip sharks. So we're also able to find some really cool ecological information that grey reef sharks, it looks, naturally spend less time moving around and visit less areas um, compared to silver tip sharks, which kind of makes sense because they, they um, occupy the same areas and we're wondering why, how, how do they compete? Do they compete for food? But just like grey reef sharks, stay on one reef, the silver tech sharks move around, which is a really interesting finding as well. And this plot is basically just shows the, um, the, the residency. So likewise, um, during low stressful conditions, they move to lots of different areas. They're resident in fewer areas and those areas are smaller. When the stress on the reefs goes up, they have kind of big residency areas. So they're spending more time in single places. Um, so it's kind of an interesting finding that as stress goes up, they move less. And the same goes on for the great reef sharks as well here. So what is driving this? Um, well, <laughs> yeah. Um, basically, we think they're, as, as, as it gets more stressful, they're just reducing their movements in order to save energy um, so until better conditions come along. So it's really hot. They're, these guys are ectotherms. They don't want to waste their energy. Um, so they're moving less. Um, the alternative hypothesis we're coming up with, which we need to look into, is that when the stress goes up, the reefs might be damaged and they might get bleached. If there's more bleaching, there's less camouflage for the fish. So it might be that the fish actually stand out a bit more and they're actually staying in the same area. They don't have to travel as much to find food because they see the food right straight away. So we're gonna, that's kind of the working hypothesis, one of these two that we're going to test. So basically either they don't move around as much or they're just staying in the same place because they can just get nice and fat there. Um, but what are the kind of ecological and conservation implications of this? Well, if they're all staying on the reef at the same time, they could probably kind of extirpate and remove a lot of the food that's there. They're not moving around. They're not letting this resource recover. So over time, if the fish get depleted, the sharks will then, <laughs> the sharks will then plummet as well. So it could have ecological percussions of this. Also, illegal and unregulated fishing. Um, so even though it's a moon protected area, you still get quite a lot of illegal fishing coming into the area. Because this uh, Chinese fin trade um, is quite, um, it's, well, it's very uh, lucrative. So they all come in and if all these sharks are on one reef system and not moving around much, a single population could get completely removed all from one reef system all in one go. So it could um, have um, significant cons conservation implications. Um, so it's probably about time for me to wrap up. Um, so yeah, I've just kind of gone over, hopefully, a little bit of reef shark and ecology and conservation, um, showing that we can use how we use satellites to monitor changing ocean habitats. We kind of showed that increased envir environmental stress on coral reefs reduces the movement on sh reef sharks, and that climate change could have therefore had have important consequences for the ecology and conservation of reef sharks um, globally. And yeah, thanks. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mike. Any questions, comments, observations? Yeah, um, how, how um, often are uh, El Nino events? More, more and more. Of course, there we go. Here we go. Yeah. Um, well, they used to only happen every few years or so. So it might be they might go 10, 15 years without one. But because of global climate change, they're happening really, really regularly now. So they're every two or three years. So there was the last one was I think last year, 2019. There was 2016, 15. Um, but before that, it was 2008. Before that, was like 1998. It changes in place to place, but the frequency of them is increasing, which is a bit of a problem for the reef system. So when a reef bleaches, it doesn't necessarily die off completely. They can recover. But if they're getting hit again the next year, that's going to go down. So yeah, it's, they're increasing overall. Any more questions? Yep. Uh, it's, it's, that area is massive. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's, especially with COVID and there's been other things going on in marine protected areas, um, it's very hard to patrol. There's just not a lot of money. That, that marine protected area is, I think the outline is something like 600,000 square miles. It, it was, at the time when it came in, uh, the biggest marine protected area in, in, um, in the world. 
and they have one vessel monitoring it. So what can happen is that you'll get lots of fishing boats come in. One will tie up the marine, but uh, will tie up the um, patrol vessel, while the other ones will fish around there. So it is a bit of a problem in, in this area. Um, I'm not sure whether it's increasing as such, but it's uh, it's 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 just a bit of a problem. <laughs> it's, well, it's a rather large problem for this area and, and globally. Just monitoring it. Any more questions? The oceans are warmed up, and sharks have really got to find food elsewhere. So, I don't know, say 50 years' time, is it possible to get rid of sharks, say, off the coast of Alaska? I mean, I mean, there has been, you'll see these reports in the Daily Mail constantly just saying there's going to be big sharks coming to close to our, clo uh, our shores. The answer is we don't know, but but populations of marine species are moving north. Maybe not as far up as Alaska, but we're getting definitely warmer warmer. Um, adapted species are moving north and the colder adapted species are moving up further. You might not get those the big tiger sharks and bull sharks up by Alaska, but species are definitely moving up. There's lots of there's lots of records of lots of different fish species. There's dolphin species that we'd never ever seen um, up in Scotland that are now common in Scotland in the last twenty years because of climate change. Um, you know the Google platform that you were showing earlier? Yeah, perfect. It's, it's data from NOAA and, Sat and, and the European Space Agency. They put it on for any one of us to access. So it's a, it's a great tool to anybody. It requires a bit of coding, but if I can do it, and I'm not the brightest, and really most people can. So I was definitely not a coder or anything like that, but I managed to figure it out. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really cool resource because before satellite remote sensing data was costing thousands and thousands of pounds of research. And now it's just kind of nicely available for us to access, which is pretty cool. Yeah, so um, one of your slides said that one in five fish are caught illegally. Do you know where those fish end up? Do they go to Tesco's? Am I buying them at the fishmonger? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good question. Um, it's really hard to tell. I, um, I believe, I'm definitely not an expert in IUU fishing. I, I lifted that from a uh, from a, a, a from a website, um, and I did look at the stats. It looks. <laughs> I looked at the paper. It looks normal. Um, it's really hard to tell the fish. If you're following like the MSC or something like that, if you're worried about fish, there's a really good app called the MSC app, and you go in there, and that will tell you the different levels of fish. So it gives you basically a, it's a, a traffic traffic light scheme. So it's green, orange, and red. Um, I think Constance positive. Good fish guide. Good fish guide. Yeah, that's it. Um, so if you're kind of worried about those kind of things, kind of go to that. But they sh in theory, they shouldn't. But if you're, maybe not in Tesco, but if you're eating abroad or something like that, and because a lot of these illegal um, illegal fisheries, they're coming from people who need to fish to make a living, right? So they're coming and it's illegal from that. So they're bringing out, so you, it's very hard to tell. I mean, they found like species of shark and, and like in LA, in LA restaurants and things like that when they've done DNA, DNA testing and marked as other species. It's kind of pervasive and gets everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. As Mike talks to Hannah, our next speaker, I'll just fill the void with something. <laughs> Hannah, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have to figure out how to use this first. Big button, okay. I'm gonna keep running to the laptop to switch it. Um, hi, I'm Hannah. Um, yeah, as Andrew said, I'm a PhD student at King's. I'm also at the Institute of Zoology, which is part of London Zoo, and I use a lot of data from the RSPB. Um, and I'm talking to you about Fitbirds, which is a terrible pun on Fitbits and birds, and I'm going to blame Brandon for it. <laughs> um, but it's basically about how we track seabirds to monitor their activity when they're out at sea. So this is me. A uh, bit of general stuff about me. I'm kind of like Mike. I like uh, going out, finding marine top predators, so things like seals, sea lions, uh, turtles, <coughs> seabirds, and whales, um, and putting tags on them to see what they're doing when they're out at sea, when they're not close to land and we don't know what they're doing. Um, 
yeah, like Mike, just an excuse to go to cool places and see cool stuff. Like this grey slope that you can see, all of that is penguins. Um, the picture doesn't really convey the noise or the smell, um, but trust me, it is unbelievable. <laughs> David Attenborough never talks about that. Um, so in case Andrew tricked you into coming here, forced you to get a ticket, or you booked your ticket a while ago and you have no idea what's going on, I will give you a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, what is a seabird? Why are they important? The threats that seabirds are facing some, and some of the solutions that we can use to combat that. One of them, giving them a Fitbit, and how that information can then be used to conserve and protect seabirds. And then a quick bit about seabirds as spies, and then question time where, if I've made no sense, you can ask me to repeat everything. So when we talk about seabirds, this is what a lot of people think straight away. The thieves who steal your chips at the seaside. Um, gulls, often herring gulls, um, or penguins, of course. Everyone loves a penguin, uh, even if they are devious, like Feathers McGraw over there. Um, but actually, seabirds is a huge um, uh, variety of, <laughs> of animals. It's over 350 species from loads of different families and taxonomic groups all over the globe. Um, and like a lot of things in biology, they don't fit into a very neat category. Generally, a seabird is something that depends on the marine environment for some or most of its food. Um, but as these ladies pointed out, it's not always true. Uh, but in general, it is. And they do share a few characteristics. They tend to mature at a late age, so often five to ten years old, uh, which obviously for us doesn't sound like much, but in the animal kingdom, not reproducing until you're like five or ten years old is quite mature. They take their time. They also take their time to find the right partner. They often are monogamous, and they settle down with one, one other bird for a long time. Um, and so this, this bird, actually, uh, she, Wisdom, who lives in Hawaii, um, is over 66 years old and is still laying eggs and raising chicks. Like, that is dedication to motherhood. Um, they often only, I mean, if you're going to keep having eggs until you're 66, you want to do it slowly. So they have one at a time, maybe two. They reproduce maybe once a year, sometimes only every other year. Um, and they invest a lot in their chicks. So they come back and they feed them for a long period. For wandering albatrosses, which is what these birds are, they can feed their chick for up to 18 months. Um, so they really invest in that one chick over a long period of time. And then they take a break and just fly around Antarctica for a couple of years to recover. Um, so if you don't already love seabirds, you really should, because they're awesome. Um, not just because they are, but they're also really important for humans. Um, so they're a big part of the marine ecological system, but they're also really important in the terrestrial environment. So seabirds go out to sea, they fish in big pelagic areas offshore, they collect fish, but then they come back to land and that's where they breed or they roost. And, and while they're there, they poo. Sometimes they die, and the nutrients from their bodies, from their feces, goes onto the soil. And then that is absorbed by plants. So in areas where you have seabirds, you often have higher varieties and abundance of plants. And because of that, you have more invertebrates. Because of that, you have more reptiles. You have more other animals. Um, and often seabirds live in areas which are naturally quite resource poor, so coastal areas or oceanic islands. So they add a lot of nutrients to those areas. <laughs> And even more amazingly, because of runoff, because of rain and things like that, washing their poo and those nutrients out onto the offshore, the close areas, the shallow waters nearby also become more productive. So coral reefs do better. Coral reefs are bigger, healthier um, around islands that have seabirds on them. And where you get better coral reefs, you get better fish. You get more fish, you get bigger fish. And that's actually really important for humans because most of the human population lives on the coast and they depend on fish for either their primary protein source, for economics, for their industry. So it's actually really important for food security as well for people. Um, so yeah, I told you they're awesome. Um, but... Unfortunately, for the past 70 years, seabirds have been going, undergoing dramatic declines all across the globe. And 
the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, has also said that half of these species are still undergoing declines. So not only have they gone under this massive decline, it's still happening. Um, so we really need to do something about it. The causes for this are quite complex and there's often a lot of interacting factors. One of the things is bycatch, which Mike briefly mentioned with sharks, them getting caught in fisheries when they're out at sea and also competing with fisheries for the same prey. So we and the seabirds might want to eat the same thing and that affects how much food there is for them. Um, plastic pollution, we've all heard about it. Marine plastics, we all know about it. So seabirds will often ingest uh, plastic either by accident when they're looking for something else or intentionally thinking that it's krill or, f or small fish or something like that. It gets into their digestive system, they have compaction, they can't eat properly and they starve. Um, and they often also feed that to their chicks. Um, other things, other causes of pollution, like oil spills, again, it can be ingested, it can get in their feathers, that means they can't, they're no longer waterproof, they can drown. Um, climate change. So with sea level rise, some breeding habitats can be affected, but also there are things that you might not necessarily expect. So their prey actually might shift. So this is a puffin, a lot of you probably recognize them, we get them here in the UK. Puffins feed on sand eels, which are these small, really oily, really fatty, rich fish. And this is what they feed to their chicks. Because of climate change, sand deals are moving much further north, and they're being replaced by something called a pipe fish, which is a bit like a seahorse, but it's long and thin. And it's much more bony and cartilaginous, and it's not as rich and fatty. They feed this to their chicks in the same amount instead, because that's what's available. But the chicks are then underweight. They're not getting as many nutrients as they need, so they become less healthy adults, and they are less able to live healthy lives and raise their own chicks. Um, so it's an unforeseen consequence of climate change that is happening. Disturbance to nest ha nests and habitats, um, like that can be just with dog walking or you know people walking in areas where there are birds raising their chicks, but also we love the beach. We always want to live by the beach, so it's some of the best property, right? It's the most valuable property. So we build in areas which maybe seabirds are using and that affects how much breeding habitat they have. And invasive species. He might look cute, but he's not. Um, <laughs> So rats, cats, snakes, these are all things that we have a history of introducing to places where they've never been before, where there are seabirds who aren't used to dealing with them. And these animals will prey on what is very easy food, so eggs, chicks, even occasionally adults, um, because they're not adapted to live with this kind of predation. And then, of course, all of these things can combine um, to really make a whole environment of pressure on seabirds. But there are solutions, sorry, I know that was a really depressing slide. <laughs> there are solutions, I swear. Um, but so for fisheries, um, there are lots of uh, ways of conducting fishing where you can reduce the amount of bycatch that happens. There's a lot of research going into it and there are actually really simple solutions. If you just drop your nets at night, the seabirds aren't there, they're asleep. They're not gonna get caught in the nets. If you put weights on it so it sinks faster, then the birds don't have time to latch onto it or get in it. There are options available, it's just about getting governments and fishers to adopt them. Um, but it makes sense for fishers as well because every bird you have on a hook is one less fish. So economically it makes sense as well. Say no to single-use plastic. I'm sure you've all heard it before. We just need to reduce our single-use plastic. And we all need to recycle more and look at alternatives and just stop these things getting into the marine environment. And make sure there are stringent mitigation measures in place for if there is an oil spill, what are you going to do about it? Who's going to clear it up? How can they get there quickly and make sure it doesn't affect marine animals? Changing to renewables, obviously, you know, climate change is a huge thing. There are so many benefits to us just making that change, getting away from fossil fuels, slowing climate change. Protecting areas that birds use. So whether it's nesting habitat, whether it's feeding habitat, making those areas, um, like pointing them out basically, knowing where they are and earmarking them for birds. 
and of course getting rid of invasive species. This is something that's going on on lots of different islands around the world. They're trying to get rid of introduced rats and cats and things and it has a huge difference. So the thing that I'm really interested in is protecting habitat. That's the thing that I'm like most passionate about and that I'm working on, particularly marine protected areas, which Constance is going to talk about later. So marine protected areas can be really useful for seabirds because you can protect the place where they actually interact with the water, the place where they're feeding, because that's the places where they, they have the potential to come to harm in things like getting into oil slicks, ingesting plastics, or getting caught in fisheries. So knowing where these areas are is really important. But how do we do that? Unfortunately, most seabird feeding events are not caught on CCTV, um, if only. Um, so this is where the Fitbit comes in. Um, how many people here have a Fitbit? Or a Google, and like an Apple Watch does the same thing, right? Oh, not that many. Oh, God. <laughs> do any of you use Strava? <laughs> like any of these fitness things? Um, basically, it's a tracker to, to kind of follow their activity, but we have to fill in some of the gaps. So this is what we do to the birds. We put little tags on them. And there are loads of different metrics or measures you can take. Um, date and time, GPS location from satellites, um, temperature, wet and dry sensors, so you know if it's in the water or on the water. Um, and it, what you use kind of depends on what your bird is, what it, the way it feeds, and also the questions that you want to answer. So for example, I don't know if any of you have ever seen gannets off the coast. When they dive, they do this amazing, they fly, and then they suddenly dive really fast. So for something like a gannet, maybe you want um, a gyroscope or accelerometry, so you can pick up that time when they suddenly rapidly accelerate, and then you know they're probably feeding. Or the gyroscope to say they've suddenly changed their angle massively, and that would be a feeding event, so you know that they're, um, yeah, they're probably foraging there. Or something like skewers. Again, you might have seen skewers. Uh, they call them bonksies up in Scotland. They actually chase other birds. It's, it means bully. They chase other birds and like pull at their feathers until they vomit. It's called kleptoparasism, um, where they basically make them vomit and then they eat it. So something like that. How are you going to pick that up? Maybe you need a camera or something like that. Yeah, I know, it's gross. <laughs> <laughs> but smart. <laughs> so... But you can't do all of these things. We do not want our birds to look like these guys. So you have to be a bit selective with what you're going to put on the bird. So for me, I focus on date and time and then a GPS location. Um, and I use these tags. They're called I Got You. And they're kind of, they weren't designed for birds. They were designed for people who thought their spouses were cheating, who wanted to secretly tag them. <laughs> So weird. <laughs> um, but seabird scientists, I don't know who the first seabird scientist was who found one of these, but what we do is we break open the case, we put them in plastic and then heat shrink it to make them waterproof, and then we tesser tape them to the bird. And then when they come back to land, we take them off again, we download them. So I have a couple, uh, just in case you want to feel them they're not so they're not too heavy that's the thing we didn't want to like overload them with too much um but this gives me yeah a time and a date and a location um to see whether this kitty wake is cheating on this kitty wake <laughs> um and what i end up with is tracks like this which are a bit of a hot mess but you get a general idea of where they're going and you also get um if anyone here is a runner, I can effectively work out their splits. So with each location, how quickly did they get there? Because I have a location and I have the time between that. Um, and then I can work out the different activities that they're doing. So um, based on basically how quickly they're getting from point A to point B, point B to point C, et cetera, et cetera. And the other thing I can work out is kind of their direction. We call it tortuosity. So are they going really straight? Or are they kind of meandering? Or are they just going in circles? Um, and again, this helps me figure out what it is, what activity they might be doing. So for example, if they're flying between point A and point B, 
they've probably gone a really long distance. They're going at speed. So I know their speed is probably fast because they've covered a big distance. And they're from point A to B to C to D, they're going in a similar direction, right? So they're going quickly in the same direction. Searching, something more like this. You know, they're going at a slower, between each point, they're going a bit slower, and they're moving around a bit. They're not going in such a straight position. Uh, direction. And then finally, something like foraging. So for gannets, it might be diving. For other birds, it might be just skimming the surface of the water. But it's very, very slow. And they're changing direction a lot and staying in a similar area. So that's, what, that's the behavior that I'm interested in, is when they're foraging and interacting with the sea surface. And from that, I can build little maps about what are the key areas? Where are they doing this? Where's this behavior happening? Because that's the area that we want to protect. And with the models that I've made, I can, if I want to, if anyone's interested in modeling, I can verify my models using another tag that I've put on the leg, which is basically just a wet dry sensor. So I can say, this is where I think they're feeding. Can I verify that with the fact that they're actually in the water? for a long period of time. Um, so I have some of these as well. Um, one of them has a little bit of bird poo on, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I did try and clean it. Um, and one of them has like a bit of the cable tie attached and self-amalgamating tape, so just so you can see what we actually put on them. And we attach them to rings. If anyone's seen birds with a color ring or numbers on it, like we do that at the same time. So we can identify individuals. So then, so I've got my foraging behavior figured out. I know where it's happening. And then I use satellite data, like what Mike was talking about, to say, what's the environment like there? What kind of sea surface temperature is it? What kind of plankton or food might be there? What are the environmental conditions? Because I can't tag every bird, right? I can only tag a sample of them. And they're all around the coast. And I only have small numbers with tags on. But if I know what kind of conditions they like, I can extrapolate up to where else around the coast might they be using habitat. Um, so I can build a map beyond the data that I have. And another step beyond that as well is to look at how they might move under climate change scenarios. So the International Panel on Climate Change have come up with different models of under different scenarios, if we continue as normal, if we limit our, our climate, um, our greenhouse gases, how might the environment change? So I can build up models based on those scenarios of where might the habitats move? Will they move? Will they completely disappear? Will they be out of reach for the seabirds that we have? Um, and I can make these maps of potential suitability. So under different scenarios or in different time spots, in like 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, are those areas going to have changed? Are those areas going to have disappeared? And I can bring that back to our current network of marine protected areas. Are the marine protected areas that we have at the moment suitable for seabirds? Are they suitable now? Are they going to be suitable in the future? Or do we need to think about maybe moving them or adapting them? Because there are great things that we can do. If we know where the seabirds are, we can either limit fishing or, say, only use certain kinds of fishing, which doesn't affect those seabirds in that place or we can target you know there's so much marine plastic out there but if we know where the seabirds are feeding we can target those areas for cleanups and things or potentially limit you know off-sea drilling like yes you can drill here but just you can't drill here because this is an area where it would have the most impact on seabirds um, and we can also predict where we might see other species coming into our waters. I think it's very unlikely that we'll see penguins in Scotland, but this is the only image I could find for a traveling seabird. <laughs> and then hopefully we'll have some very happy birds. Um, the puffins are so great. Uh, yeah, so we'll hope for some happy little birds after that. The last thing I want to talk to you about quickly is about how tagging seabirds can help us as well, not just the birds. So. Boats over a certain size, when they go fishing, they have to have a transponder on to, to say basically where they are at sea. And that is for safety, but it's also so that we can regulate what they're doing. Because fishing is very political. 
you're allowed a certain amount of fish and you're allowed to fish in certain areas. So people are always interested in where that is and what's going on, making sure that you're following internationally agreed rules, including whether or not you're going into marine protected areas where you shouldn't be. But sometimes people either turn their transponder off or they just don't have one. And that's some of the illegal, unregulated fishing that Mike was talking about. So what has been done is in around Antarctica, people put tags on seabirds, on these albatross, that can detect radar, which is what the bo fishing boats use to detect fish under the water. And the seabirds sent out a signal from their tags when they found a boat using radar. And then if that radar signal, that location, didn't match up with a transponder location, the scientists knew that there was someone fishing there illegally without their transponder on. So they could send somebody out, and if it's a place like where Mike was talking about, where you've got a huge area and one vessel to try and find people, if you've got a bird effectively reporting back, there's a boat over here, it saves time and money, and you can get straight there. So the seabirds are policing the oceans for us. <laughs> So, just wanted to wrap up, basically. Seabirds are awesome, more than just stealing your food. Or maybe you want to give them some chips now, you know how great they are. They're extremely threatened, and their conservation is really important, but there are ways to do it, and we're working on it. And tagging is one of those, those things that can help us find out how to protect them. And finally, they might be watching you, so be careful. <laughs> um, I hope that made sense. Otherwise, ask... <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Hannah, wait, where are you going? We have questions. Hannah, Hannah, we, we, have, we have questions. Who's got a question? Stand here and look pretty. Who's got a question for Hannah? Yes. Um, so with land animals, uh, we're concerned that they may not be able to kind of move up the world because there's seas and cliffs in the way. Yeah. Um, with, the, with birds, should we be less worried about them because they'll move up with their food? Um, to an extent, so they may be able to travel, yeah, to follow their prey or to follow conditions um, when they're flying, but seabirds, they always nest on land, so it depends on them having space to nest if they have to move further north. Um, they're, because they are so long-lived, they're, qu um, they're quite... Uh, attached to their breeding sites. They often go back to breeding sites where they were raised. So trying to get them to move their breeding sites might be quite difficult. And then if they need to get back and forth to feed a chick within a certain amount of time, and they're having to go further and further distances to get their food, they may not be able to feed the chick enough. Um, so I think there is some flexibility, some resilience, but um, certainly not enough with the rate that the ocean is changing. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hey, so has Sheriff Albatross <laughs> successfully found any illegal fishes and was mm -hmm. there anything done about the illegal fishing or is it just a, an idea? So the scientists who did this found the numbers basically, the numbers of, of um, illegal fishing that was happening but getting somebody to take responsibility for like cracking down on those fishes is quite difficult um, because you need a government or an international body that is unified in catching those. So no, the scientists have done the like, this is how much we think is going on, um, but the next step of like regulating it um, hasn't been taken up yet because it costs so much money. Um, sending boats out there to catch people and then it becomes very political about who punishes who you know so no unfortunately next step <laughs> anyone else hey First of all, the modeling, you looked at the marine areas and the conflict other question about the land uh, were you looking at the breeding sites as well to look at the conditions that might change in the future like, are you trying to combine those in any way to see what the differences might be? Because you were looking at the different scenarios yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Is there any move to actually look at the land and the breeding sites as well to see compared against the marine changes? So, not yet. Not yet. But that would be something to do 
for a postdoc potentially if someone wants to pay me. <laughs> um, no, it's a great idea and obviously those things are so linked like with your question, the breeding site and the feeding location have to be within the perfect distance basically. Um, so yeah, you can't, having one isn't really helpful without the other so it would be a great thing to do but I haven't got there yet. <laughs> One follow-up question, just like what kind of model were you using for the modeling? Was it Maxim by any chance? Uh, I was using hidden Markov models for the uh, behavioral stuff, um, and then just linear models for the environmental variables versus locations. That's right. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Everyone just... Like a teacher. Shh. I have all the power. Right, so thank you. Welcome back to Point of Science. Congrats to our quiz winners again. Uh, yeah? So our final talk. Is this your slide, Constance? No. No, it's not. That's the entire event. Didn't prepare. I told you. Ta-da! So our last talk is from Constance Shrey, who I said was a doctoral candidate. She's also doing a master's and a bachelor's at the same time. She's crazy. So PhD in England, master's in Scotland, bachelor's in Ireland. So foundation degree in Wales, and you're sorted, babes. Um, but without further ado, over to my crazy friend Constance for her talk on, is this the real science or is this just fantasy? Can I, can I, can I, can I have the clicker? So, and then Freddie Mercury. So, um, yeah, the, so is this just the real science? Is it just fantasy? A uh, terrible pun, you know, it's been a theme for us. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Oh, I don't like that. No. It's rained enough today, let's be honest. So, um, I'm actually going to be talking about marine protected areas, and um, our colleagues have spoken a little bit about them, but I'm going to talk about all the logistics and some of the limitations that come with marine protected areas. So, a little bit about me. Um, so I also do work with seabirds and sharks and all that, but I do them within MPAs and I do that on the monitoring side. Um, so these are actually so juvenile gannets. Um, so Hannah's talked a little bit about those. Um, our friend Lara Skull down here, they do a bit of diving as well. And uh, these photos were taken, all of them are taken in France, in Brittany, where I'm from. I know I don't sign it, but I am très française. <laughs> um, so today's talk, we're going to talk about what really is an MPA. Um, what makes an MPA effective, and then what, are, what, what does protection mean? Um, and actually, if you look at this slide right here, that's actually the MPA I work on in France, and that is, those are birds, those are gannets, and that's about 20,000 couples of gannets, and so they actually nest in these sites um, in, in Brittany, um, in the channel, and so um, that's one of the places that we're trying to protect because it is one of the main nesting sites for these birds um, in the English Channel. And uh, I've actually been up there with those 40,000 birds and their chicks, and it smells so bad. You never get it off you. You kind of like have these moments where you're like, mm, I know what that is. Um, so what is a marine protected area? So they're designated for the conservation of marine life uh, in the face of exploitation um, and other threats that are related to human activity. They are designed to ensure long-term conservation um, of species and habitats, but also considering socioeconomic outcomes. So we're looking at the ecosystem at its greatest scale, um, including humans as part of the ecosystem. And they can be designated at the national, regional, and international level, and they usually have a set of, or they should have a set of conservation objectives. And so you might be familiar with the Natura 2000 sites, um, which now under Brexit, have been uh, absorbed into UK legislation, or the Ramsar wetlands of international importance. So you've got like Natura 2000 at the European level and uh, Ramsar at the international. So what do marine protected areas do? So there's actually different levels of protection within a marine protected area. So you can go all the way from a no-take zone or a marine reserve uh, that allows no permitted activities, um, all the way to multi-use zones, and there you've got like your divers and your fishing boats and all that. Um, and then some of them have uh, different restrictions, so hook and line trawling, um, hook and line fishing is fine, but trawling is banned, or even activities like kayaking, that's fine, but jet skis are not allowed because of the nose pollution that, um, that they bring. So in the last few years, there's been a race to designate, and we're all hearing about the 30 by 30, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, but there's been a rise in MPA designation since the early 2000s. 
And we've been up by about 10 million kilometers squares since the turn of the century. Just to give you guys an idea, that's the size of Canada. Um, and so we've gone from like 0.1% uh, in the 20th century to about 5 to 7% today. And these are estimates because we don't really know exactly how much of that is really protected. So this can actually cause an illusion of marine conservation because designation doesn't always equal protection. So then what do we end up with is paper parks. And so paper parks are um, protected areas, terrestrial or marine, that exist solely in le legislation and um, basically drawn on a map, but there's no active management, monitoring, or surveillance in, for, um, in place. So my PhD is on the Irish Sea, and um, so just to give you a little bit of information about it, um, it's obviously it separates the islands of Ireland and Britain, but it also um, has about uh, 6 million people living within 10 kilometers of its coast. And so, um, and related activities employed upwards of 1.5 million people. And that could be fishing, tourism, and other activities. The threats um, include, of course, fishing, agricultural runoff, because a lot of uh, the Irish Sea coast um, is um, farmland, and um, oil spills, climate change, basically your usual suspects. And uh, Mike and, and Hannah have talked about that a bit. And some of the key species that we'll see is, so we've got some basking sharks, so we do have some sharks up here, usually up in the Donegal coast, but um, around this side of Ireland. Um, uh, Arctic skewers, Dublin Bay prawns, the delicacy, um, grey seals, sea bass, um, and obviously so many birds. So let's start with um, MPA effectiveness and a checklist. So first of all, we've got designation, management, monitoring, and equitable governance. And all of these need to be working for the MPA itself to work. So um, this was, uh, I can't remember what year this was, but it was a couple of years ago. Uh, Edgar et al. basically um, identified uh, key features that um, made a, protected, a marine protected area effective. So no take, pretty self-explanatory, that's a reserve. Enforced, enforcement's really important. And uh, as Hannah pointed out, or and Mike as well, when there's no enforcement, you really can't monitor what's going on um, if there's illegal fishing or anything like that. So it needs to be enforced. It needs to be old, this is mostly for our data, so we can see whether or not um, it is effective. The larger the MPA, the better. Isolated, like with Mike's uh, MPA that's in the middle of nowhere, really easy to make sure that there is less human interference. Um, but as you see, if it's not enforced, it doesn't work out well. And then that got me thinking about designations. Because if we're going to designate, might as well do the whole thing and protect as, um, and monitor as well. So just to give a quick overview of what we've got in the, in the Irish Sea. Um, so as I mentioned, we've got multiple designations. So at national level, so your MCZs, your Marine Conservation Zones, that will be a UK designation, all the way up to um, your international designations. And then, of course, the Irish Sea is a bit complicated because it has multiple jurisdictions um, that oversee it. So England, Isle of Man, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, um, southern part of Ireland, and the north. And well, when I did this study, this was about two or three years ago, there were 198 designations across 112 sites. With the race to designate, this is probably more. Um, and all of this is usually overseen by a number of organizations. Um, you've probably heard of Natural England, Marine Scotland, the Marine uh, Management Organization that oversees um, Scotland, Wales, and England. Um, and then, of course, then you've got Northern Ireland and the Republic who do things differently because they're on the other side. But that creates, there's so much, so many people, so many actors, so much legislation, so you end up with something like this. And this is a horrendogram that was sent to me by a colleague at the University of Bristol, and he didn't design it. But the way it works is that you've got the legal, the international laws, and then it, it kind of peters out to all the licenses in the, at the national level. And it gets really confusing, because the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. There's a lack of communication between different governments, different um, offices or departments within each government. And so that can actually negatively affect biodiversity. So then the management comes in. So um, this is one of this is one of my actually first study out of my PhD. It was published in 2020 um, in the um, International <coughs> Journal of Sustainable Development and, Marine and World Ecology, and it looked at this question about designations, like what impact do they have on the effectiveness of marine protected areas in the Irish Sea. So a little bit of the science part. What did I do for this? Uh, so I went through a lot of databases looking at all the MPAs that you could find in the Irish Sea. And um, I cross referenced that through um, the IUCN's World Database on Protected Areas and then the uh, Marine Conservation Institute's MPA Atlas to make sure that I didn't l miss out any of them. And then I looked at whether or not they had conservation objectives, a management plan, um, and whether or not they were being regularly um, assessed um, in terms of monitoring. 
And then when there was monitoring, I looked at how many of those were in favorable conditions based on um, the conservation objectives that were laid out, so for their, uh, the species or habitats, listing them basically as favorable or unfavorable because every jurisdiction has its different levels of favorable recovering or you know, unfavorable or you know, basically um, completely damaged beyond repair. Um, and then I did some statistics uh, <laughs> to get these results. Uh, so the analysis basically showed that um, across all these designations and these sites, the number of designations actually showed a, had a positive effect um, over whether an MPA um, had a management of plan or not. So, and one of the reasons is because these designations are supposed to be legally binding. Um, and then a site is more likely to be monitored if it has a management plan. Shocker. Um, <laughs> and then finally, so if you kind of go through that, um, you see that multiple designations appears to have a positive influ influence on the biological conservation. So we're seeing more favorable conservation statuses the more designations there are. Um, however, uh, many sites lack management plans and monitoring, so we call them paper parks. They're still here. And there's, there's quite a few around, uh, around, the UK, around the world, to be honest. So once we've gone over designation and management, then we look at this, the difficulties of monitoring. And this is the uh, research I'm working on right now. Um, I'm looking at mudflats, because nobody really cares about mudflats, but they're really amazing. Um, and looking at um, how are we going to monitor them, because they are really difficult to, um, to monitor. So just a little bit about mudflats themselves. They're really productive coastal habitats. Um, they serve as a transition zone between terrestrial and marine ecosystems, so estuaries. Um, and they provide feeding and roosting sites for overwintering and wading birds, as well as nursery grounds for fi uh, fish and shellfish species. And, so, and they also, on top of that, serve as a nutrient sink and source. So they're really important, but unfortunately, even though they're listed as a uh, Annex 1 habitat under the EU Habitats Directive and are a designation feature in the UK, um, in Europe, they're considered unfavorable globally, and in the UK, they're classed majoritively as an um, unfavorable bad. This is usually largely due to resource constraints, so we've talked a little bit about that with um, Mike and Hannah, about the fact that there isn't enough money to actively manage, monitor, and enforce. Dangerous conditions, because, well, it's mud, you get stuck in it, you die. Um, <laughs> uh, and, of course, a lack of baseline data to appropriately measure conservation impacts. Um, these all, all present obstacles uh, to uh, effective management and monitoring of these mudflats. And this is why I selected them as a case study within a case study. Um, so some of the threats, of course, are going to be climate change, waste and pollution, and human disturbance. Didn't need to go over that because we've <laughs> talked about it enough today. Um, and so how do we monitor them? Because you know, if, you, if it's hard to get out onto a mudflat, um, we basically use proxy indicators. So we'll look at some remote sensing, um, water quality data, looking at um, how polluted the water is, um, usually due to agricultural runoff or um, wa um, wastewater discharge sites, and species population data. So how healthy are the species? Are they, it, it, is the population rich? Uh, is there their evenness? All these complicated terms that basically show us that um, these species are uh, thriving. So this research is ongoing. This is what I'm working on right now um, uh, as the last part of my PhD. Um, but finally, I'm going to talk about equitable governance because, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, different types of species and habitats, um, but where, what role do humans play if, it hasn't, if it's not a destructive one? And um, so the um, Con Convention on Biological Diversity's IET Target 11 um, this was done in 2010, but wanted by 2020, their target was 10% of coastal and marine areas to be effectively and equitably managed. Um, so equitable conservation really means that people share all the costs and benefits that come from the use of um, natural resources, and stakeholders are treated fairly and inclusively. And so this is why the effectiveness of MPAs um, as a conservation tool remains largely debated, because there's um, lack of monitoring, there's lack of management, and also because uh, people who live around these marine protected areas on the coast don't feel included, and even though they might have um, more knowledge than we do as scientists, they are excluded from uh, decision making. So this is a study that I published um, last summer. Um, it's in Frontiers of Marine Science, and it was looking at to what extent are marine protected areas um, equitably governed and managed. And to do this, I um, looked at three different sites, so Strangford Lock, Northern Ireland, Carlingford Lock, which basically serves as, um, as one of the, the borders of, well, there's no border, but, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> um, uh, between the north and the south of Ireland, and uh, the Solway Firth, which um, 
effectively acts as a border as well between Scotland and, um, and England. And so I'm not going to go through all of it, but just to give you an idea of what was done here is, so I, um, had a, I did a survey of um, the different stakeholders uh, of Strangford Lock, and so that included MPA management, so that's DIRA, the Department of um, Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs in Northern Ireland, um, recreational users, so your marine users, that would be your fishers, your divers, uh, coastal users, so that would be people who um, enjoy doing like um, bird watching, dog walking, that kind of stuff. Local business operators, local community members, and other, others, mostly scientists. <laughs> uh, but looking at, um, on a scale, uh, how, how much uh, they felt that, they were, that their rights were being respected, um, that they were giving opportunities to participate. And if you look at this, you see that participation was rated really highly by the MPA management, but then everybody else was like, mm-mm. <laughs> uh, same here as transpar transparency and accountability. The, um, the MPA management tended to rate itself really high. Um, and then I did semi-structured interviews with uh, different stakeholders. And so we've got um, this business owner, an aquaculturist uh, in Carlingford Lock, who basically said that they've reported issues of damage, environmental damage, animal byproduct, dumping and everything. And the answer was, uh, we don't have the resources to deal with that. So even though the citizens are concerned, the answer is, well, we can't handle this. And then at Strangford, a community member pointed out that uh, they had lived by Strangford Lock their entire lives, but didn't really know it was a marine protected area. So didn't know it was, um, that there were restrictions involved or anything like that. Um, even though there's a little bit of signage, there's just, the, the awareness isn't there. And then at the Solway, um, one stakeholder pointed out that the governments don't really see the sea as part of the constituency. So these are the local governments in the coastal areas. Um, unless they represent a commercial port, a fishing port, or somebody who has the money. So in conclusion, what I found in this study was that there is a notable, noticeable lack of awareness from the general public about the purpose of MPAs and who's responsible for the management. And so when people aren't um, aware, then they might not know that what they're doing is destructive. Management has a higher perception of equity uh, than other stakeholders. Um, but when participate, uh, opportunities for participation exist, they're often not known by stakeholders. So they'll publish... Um, uh, for consultations, but then people won't actually be aware of them. And so it's kind of like a tick boxing exercise. Yes, we've done a consultation, but you actually haven't really pooled uh, enough people. And so this study basically highlights the need for more research into equity in marine conservation, but also in terrestrial conservation. And uh, that's something that we're working on at King's. And then, um, so we've got designation, management, monitoring, and equitable governance. And all of these are a recipe for an effective marine protected area. So, um, but then what does that mean about protection? Because I've been talking, but if we look at this, um, this image right here, we can see that, so this would be before human intervention all the way to the present with all fishing or any kind of other disturbances. And so where do we go from here? Do we go fully protected, highly protected, lightly protected, minimally protected? And that depends on, of course, um, how does the MPA fit in with the local community um, and then how much you can protect because obviously if somebody's living by the coast you can't say you can't go here. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, so this is really important because we can see that you know, without human interference it'll thrive but humans belong in this ecosystem as well so we need to find a right balance. Um, so on Earth Day, so a couple of weeks ago, um, I co-authored this, um, this report with the British Ecological Society um, on protected areas and nature recovery. And so we were looking at the uh, goal by the British government to achieve 30% of UK land and seas for nature by 2030. Um, so this is available for download uh, for free on the BES website. And as soon as it dropped, this was my inbox. <laughs> so it was basically, it got picked up by the Times and even the Daily Mail um, and the Guardian. And basically, uh, spoiler alert, what it was saying was, um, that protected areas for wildlife are an empty promise. Um, that is a bit extreme. Uh, there's a lot of room for, um, I mean, there's some, some MPAs are doing, and terrestrials are doing a really great job, but um, largely we're, we're falling short of, um, of those targets. So on, actually on paper, I think we're at 38% MPAs and 20 something percent terrestrial. So we're meeting that target, but to what extent are we really meeting that target for delivering free nature? It's not quite there yet. And we don't have much time. It's already 2022. So that's me. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I love Queen. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, <laughs> any questions? Thank you, Constance. I have a question. Also, love academics. Always cite themselves. 
to back up their own arguments. <laughs> um, I have a question. You talk about the Irish Sea, but what about other islands in Europe and have similar sort of designations? What is the current, in say, Malta, for example, what is the current situation there? I knew he was going to ask this question. Um, one of the reasons is because he just booked a holiday there. But no, it's actually a really good point because I was, um, I was holidaying in Malta a few years back, so 2019, so before the pandemic. And um, I went off to Camino, um, which is supposed to be a protected area, and I spent the entire day free diving to pick up rubbish. And if you know anything about the Mediterranean, you know it's really buoyant. So free diving in the Mediterranean without weights to get to the bottom to pick up rubbish, kind of hard. Um, but yeah, so it, and there are signs. There are signs that say this is a marine protected area, but there's rubbish everywhere, and that's because you know the, there's probably no enforcement, um, and you know the, the the income from tourism is is probably more valued um, than the protected protection effort. So, does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, uh, okay, in, uh, after, because <laughs> I know you. <laughs> um, in the back and then in the front, we'll start with... Is it? Um, oh. Yeah, I was wondering if once an MPA is designated, how often you can have a change, and what's kind of the information pipeline to uh, the stakeholders, like fishers and so um, when an MPA is designated, um, so it's it's really hard when it comes to like offshore MPAs because um, obviously as we've talked about, um, you know, there's been an, a massive issue about trawling in offshore M M MPAs, and fortunately most humans don't have access to it. And uh, but there's no sign that says you know in the middle of the ocean that says this is a protected area. You know, it's it's much more complicated. When it comes to coastal zones, it's also just as complicated because we can't. It's we can see it on a map, but you know. Am I in a protected area? Am I not? So that is, you know, that's one of the problems with the awareness. A additionally, we've been, there's been some research looking into, well, if we're designating a protected area for X species um, with uh, global warming or other uh, causes that might force these key species to move, do we then move the protected area boundaries? And this is something that, um, you know, this has been largely debated. Um, I, I personally don't work on it, but, it, it be but then it becomes really complicated, obviously, going through all the legal uh, part of it to redesignate, and then what do we do that every five years or every ten years? Um, yeah, does that answer your question anymore? Yeah, uh, the other question was like, what's kind of like, how do stakeholders know where an MPA is? And well, that's that's the thing, and as we saw here, you know, Strangford Lock was one of the first MCZs to be designated. It's been a protected area for you know decades, and unless there's signage and, a pro and adequate uh, uh, communication between the government or the, pr uh, the manager and the people who live around it, they might never know. Like this person was in their 50s, 60s, who was like, I never knew this. So um, yeah, it's unfortunately, it's just a lack of awareness. Um, yeah, and I think, yeah. Um, earlier you showed a diagram kind of showing the plurality of governments. I was wondering who, you said your colleague Bristol didn't make it, do you think he did? Um, so Inna, you think it's Mike Elliott? Come on, Inna, Inna is our, our special guest tonight. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's um, a researcher from the University of Hull together with co-authors. Uh, I can send you the paper that invented this concept, um, but it's been copied around the world since, um, yeah. <laughs> but like what it really shows is how complicated you know, it is when there's all these, I mean, I'm not a jurist, I'm not an economist um, and, or a political scientist, but you know, there's so much going on, and how much do these encroach on other people's jurisdictions is, is another can of worms. Um, Inna, I know you had a question, and then Sam has a question. So, um, and then Lou. Inna, did you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Cheers. Uh, so, um, do you see um, this problem of paper parks in an optimistic way, as in we're in step one and we need to be at step five? Or do you think that the target was too ambitious and if it would have been a more realistic target, there would have been better outcomes? So realistically, 30% is nothing. And we should be looking at 60% or 70%. It's actually debated, but um, there's a consensus that we should be you know, over 50% of protected areas and actually protected areas. And that doesn't mean that you can't have um, extractive uses. It just means that it has to be sustainable and respected and enforced. And all of this costs money. And unfortunately, as you know, us scientists don't have any and the government has it, but I don't know what they do with it. It's definitely not in conservation. Um, yeah. So. yeah, I just wondered, I mean, as you know, like I look at forest protected areas um, and I know like in forests, um, a lot of, you know, local people, indigenous people and stuff are sort of arrested for like 
you know, cutting down a small tree and lighting a fire or something, while there's like huge like logging companies that are bribes <coughs> to like governments and things that just continue and you know they still have like guards and patrols and things like this. So I'm just kind of like wondering like how do you determine the success of an MPA? Because you kind of stated the things that are required, but like would you look at it like okay it has this amount of patrols or this amount of people that's getting prosecuted or like or you know is it does it tie in with um, you know what Mike and Hannah's doing like sort of tagging species and seeing you know the populations declining or increasing or whatever? So like basically when an MPA is designated, it really is for nature conservation um, and then everything else come, comes after. So as long as, so if you look at a marine protected areas management plan, it'll usually be maintain or achieve favorable condition. Um, and so that is the baseline. And that's what traditionally an MPA is designed for and that's how you, you basically measure success. And as we, but as we've seen, you know, now when you incorporate like the social economic aspect, then it's another can of worms. And um, I don't really work enough on that to, to be able to answer that question, but it's not really integrated in the management plans. And I actually looked at that a little bit in, um, in that first study and um, the number of, of management plans that actually included or talked about stakeholders was very, very low. Um, and so that's something that we need to you know, rethink about when we're talking about designation and management. And management plans are usually done every couple of years, like they're redone because the assessments are supposed to take place. But unfortunately, in real life, that's not the case. And this is, it's not because we don't want to, it's just because it costs so much money and there's just not enough manpower or resources to do so. Um, I think, was there other questions? Does that answer your question, Sam? Yeah. <laughs> we can talk about it. <laughs> so, the have questions for Hannah. What? Oh. Come on upstairs. Yeah, do you like, oh, it's general question. Fine, let's bring it. It's general question. Mike left us. So, he jumped shit. Right. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I have so many questions. You get my mind. We've never done any questions. So, my question is about um, the management plan. Because I think the management plan is really being more aware of connected areas, but also just engaging them to the next level. So for example, responding to these consultations or being part of it. And also in the context of the RFC, how important actually is that for the outcomes? Yeah, so um the, the issue, so for example, in Northern Ireland, like the issue that we've had is that so I'm part of a diving action group that was just us, we went rogue, and we uh, but we only found out about these consultations because we knew people who were on that distribution list. So for somebody who's just you know, layman and, uh, and just wants to find out about it. It's really hard. They'll publish something in the Belfast Telegraph, but somebody in County Down probably won't read it. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's making sure that everybody's aware of it. And there are some, like, local action groups, but, you know, if you're not within that, then you might not be completely aware, and, and that's definitely an issue. And drawing on my own experience, so um, I showed you some pictures of that marine protected area in France, and so right now we're working on extending that from about 200 um, hectares to 1,500. No, 15,000, sorry. And so that required a massive consultation. We've got like, we had thousands of responses. Um, I interviewed stakeholders, um, and all of this was like funded by the French government. Um, so, you know, it kind of shows that it is possible. Um, and that reserve that I showed you is only managed by three people uh, one manager and two, two guys who go around and do monitoring with me and, and other, other people. Um, to, you know, and, but a lot of it is from citizen science or from um, volunteers, um, people who just care. But, you know, it is a lot of, man hours and you know the, the resources can be stretched thin so it really depends on how how much the the governments and um, and the people want to you know work together actually well the governments need to bring the people in to be to be aware of what are the destructive activities what are the limitations the uh, the restrictions and all that um yeah so it, i mean it's really really complicated yeah. so what do you have any idea what the best mechanism for that is I think at, at designation level, so once it's designated, there should be a consultation, um, first of all, to say, right, we want to do this. Does anybody object or, you know, what, what's going on there? And, you know, really get it at the, at the source. You know, it's kind of like with plastic pollution. The best way to fight it is not cleaning it up. It's just stopping it right there. So incorporating stakeholders really at the beginning of, um, of the designation is probably the best way. And then, as I mentioned, these protected area management plans are you know, constantly being redone, well constantly, every couple of years. So incorporating them as soon as you're redoing the management plan to see how you know, people's perceptions have changed um, or if the demographics around there have changed as well. I don't know if you have something to yeah, add to that. Um, like, 
I'm pretty sure uh, that when they did the Scottish marine protected areas, uh, they did a big consultation and a lot of those areas were voted for by the public. So from the very beginning before they were even designated, they were getting public opinion from locals about what areas are important and also why. So, you know, if you've got local scallop fishermen who do hand diving scallops and there's also like industrial scallop dredgers coming in, then that gives them an opportunity to say, this is an important area, we want to protect it. So yeah, like Constance was saying, Constance was saying like from the very beginning before you're even designating, get people, local people involved um, so that everyone knows why it's important to protect and people's livelihoods are incorporated, not just nature. And actually, just to even to add to that, um, citizen science groups can also um, bring up the, uh, uh, an area um, for, for designation. That's uh, Sea Searchers. So Sea Search is an organization of divers in the UK and Ireland who um, basically record what they see on their dives. So they're trained and then they, um, they're trained for species IDing, um, but they're, you know, snorkelers do it too. But they identified um, in Northern Ireland as some sites that were, you know, important. I think it was for seagrass or something. And then they, you know, made the government aware of it. And then they kind of, started the whole thing about getting that area designated and I'm, I think it's in the process or is, has been designated in the last yeah, couple of months. <laughs> no, I'm just, but, um, but yeah, so, you know, it can. They're it can probably the ones who will monitor it as Yes, well. yeah. They're probably, like, it'll be the citizen science yeah. that actually measures how the seagrass bed yeah. is protected and how it recovers and things like that. And, and then also, it's, well, it's great to monitor, but then what do we do with that data? And it depends on if that data actually informs management. And, I mean, God, I, we could talk about this for <laughs> forever. But that's a story for another day. But, you know, there are, basically what we're trying to highlight, I think, is that it's just not black and white. And there's so many different actors, so many different um, factors to consider when it comes to marine conservation. And, you know, there's no easy solution. It, it takes a lot of collaborative effort. Um, yeah. I don't know if anybody else, any oh. <laughs> Um, so, so you're talking about marine protected areas and areas within national jurisdiction, but obviously around 70% of the ocean is beyond any state's national jurisdiction. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with the UN Convention on the War of the Sea. Um, I'm close. So <laughs> you they've, they've, been, they've been negotiating a new implementing agreement under UNCLOS, which includes a number of elements including marine protected areas um, for areas of the ocean beyond national jurisdiction. Um, which I think would be quite critical. Um, but I was just wondering what your thoughts are on how we enforce an MPA in areas beyond national jurisdiction. It's funny because we had this question last week during our dry run. Um, and I mean, we can both speak to... Uh, so it, it would be great if every government kind of sent out or had like a collaborative, you know, monitoring or enforcement organization in place. The only... One we really have at this point is like Sea Shepherd, which is like a rogue organization that goes and like follows fishing boats and piracies and all that. But there, like to my knowledge, there really isn't any multinational like police force. And again, I would love it. I think it'd be, you know, we need it, but then how do we fund it? And you know, how, and then if, like what are the interests that would be compromised from different countries? And then do countries who don't have, you know, like if it's, if, they're, if they have more um, marine areas, then do they get a bigger say or not? Like, I think is it Norway has the largest um, EZ, and I think then France, you know, so like, do, would they get more because they're, it's, lar you know, it's larger? Or, you know, I don't, you know, really, there's so many questions, but it's a really great point. Um, I just don't really know how, you know, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not a jurist, I'm not a politician. I don't know how, how realistic it is in, I, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Now. Yeah, I mean, I think for some things it's easier than others, right? So in Antarctica, basically everyone agreed that we're going to protect Antarctic waters. Um, and so if you're talking about things like drilling in Antarctica or doing that kind of extractive practice or mining the seabed, it's very easy for everyone to just keep tabs on that and say, no, you can't go and do that. With fishing, it's much harder. There's a huge illegal fishery, even though these areas are supposed to be protected. So, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how you get world politicians to agree who's going to fund... Because the thing is, it costs so much money, right, to send patrol boats out there. Um, and also, by the time they get there, 
the illegal fishing activity could have moved away. And you know, you mentioned Antarctica, but if you look at the Arctic, so the Arctic has a number of countries that have that lay claim to it, and they fight all the time about it. So, <laughs> and that's only what six or seven countries. So, um, you know, it is really, really complicated. And you know, <laughs> we could sit here all night coming up with solutions, but will they listen to us? Okay, uh, and I think. <laughs> Um, One did, minute, make it Was it Anna? Yeah, I have a short question. Um, how can we ensure better collaboration between scientists and those who work in the humanities or the social sciences? Kind of science. <laughs> kind of science. No, I do think that, like, um, having proper, like, science communication training is really important um, because it's really easy to get data and facts um, confused. Um, and especially with the media, if they're trying to sell papers, they can distort it in one way or another. And so I think that, like, yeah, be more science communication from scientists, um, I think, is probably the, the best way, uh, without the middleman in between. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, I'm interested to know, they've just introduced a new GCSE in natural sciences. I'm interested to know if that will incorporate, like, the policies related to natural science, like is that going to be all about the environment and environmental protection and kind of get people from an early point seeing it all as one holistic thing rather than dividing it into we're the scientists, we do the science and other people do the policy. Like if we start from the beginning seeing it as one big thing that's interconnected and they're all skills that we need to share, then maybe that will help. I don't know. Maybe it's too late for us. <laughs> Back to me. Um, so we have five minutes. We have five minutes to do thank yous and everything. So I will start by saying thank you to our speakers, Mike, Constance, and Hannah. Ba -ba -ba -bam. It's lonely up here. I will say thank you to the event team for putting on an amazing event over three nights. Thank you to the Devereaux for hosting us. Thank you to Tom from Thomas Line Phil for filming us. And lastly, thank you all for coming. The Planet of Science Handbook says to mention the future events, but it's the last event, the last final best one of the series, I would say. I'm not biased, so make sure you come back next year for fresh talks, fresh speakers. I might come back, I might not, who knows? But thank you and have a lovely rest of your night. <laughs>